Okay, um, members, just to confirm that we have a quorum and we have coming in on Starleaf at the moment. We have Morris, we have Sinead, we have Rosemary and Catherine and Gary. And I think that um, Jerry Carroll had also confirmed that he would be coming in via Starleaf and Tom, I think, is to be coming to the chamber at some stage. But we'll go ahead and start and hopefully Tom will, will join us. Um, so just in relation to Starleaf then, hopefully members have used it before and if you just want to um, use the hand raise facility on Starleaf if you want to come in with any questions or, or to raise any issues during the meeting. To confirm that um, members can use Wi-Fi connection for mobile devices but they should be muted or in airplane mode and tablets and laptops should only be used for committee business during meetings. Um, members, just to advise you that John O'Dowd has, is our new member on the committee. We obviously had a, a space due to myself replacing Carol as chair, and as Carol is still um, acting up for the, the Minister of Communities, we felt that it was important that we put somebody onto the committee to replace her, even if that is temporarily. So, first of all, to welcome John onto the committee, and also to say that he has given his apologies today. And I just want to confirm then with the clerk, has anybody delegated their vote? Uh, yes, so John O'Dowd has delegated his vote to the chair um, for today's meeting, and that's the only delegated vote that we have. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to the agenda then. Um, agenda item two is the draft minutes of the previous meeting. And those, that meeting was the 17th of September, and those are at page five of your papers. If any members have any comments to make, okay. I assume that we're agreed on the minutes then. Thank you. And agenda item three, then matters arising. I have no matters arising unless any members have anything to raise. Okay, I assume there are no matters arising then. Agenda item four then, members, is in relation to member statements. And you'll recall that following a request from the Speaker, the committee began considering the merits of introducing arrangements to have a short period of plenary during which members have the opportunity to put issues briefly on the record without requiring him to judge against any particular criteria. The committee wrote to all parties and independent members to seek their views and agreed to commission research. However, obviously everything was put on hold due to the pandemic. And at the last meeting on the 17th of September, the committee agreed to include member statements to its work priorities and forward work programme. I have written again to all parties and independent members to inform them that the committee has recommenced its consideration and to seek their views. And responses to that are due. We have some background noise. So, responses are due on the 23rd of October. So, today the committee will receive a briefing from Assembly Research, and your in your papers that research is at page 13, and a letter from the Speaker dated the 19th of February 2020 is at page 26. Are members content to note those items, to note the research on the letter? Content. And Ray McCaffrey is here today to give us the, the brief. And I will assume that, that members have hopefully read the research paper, but we obviously now have an opportunity for, for Ray to give us a, a brief outline and for members to ask any questions that they have arising from that briefing paper. So thank you, Ray, for joining us today. We appreciate it. And we'll let you go ahead with your briefing. OK, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, so the research looked at those provisions available for member statements in the House of Commons, Scottish Parliament, Welsh Parliament and Doyle Erin. And then in addition, international comparisons uh, were also drawn from the Australian Parliament and New Zealand Parliament. Um, and of course, there are various mechanisms for members to contribute to proceedings, but the focus of this paper um, was, of course, based on what the Speaker envisaged in his letter to, to this uh, committee. Um, so turning first to the House of Commons, um, the research didn't find anything in standing orders to allow a member to make a statement on what could be described as a topical issue. 
Um, now, Erskine May, the Guide to Parliamentary Procedure and Practice, describes personal statements. Um, but these are usually related to uh, matters of conduct, um, for example, an, an apology to the House in relation to the breach uh, of the Code of Conduct. Um, in addition, members can also apply for an emergency de debate under Standing Order 24, um, but the procedures around such debates um, wouldn't really allow the flexibility envisaged for a, a member statement. Um, another option um, in the House of Commons are Westminster Hall debates. Um, where MPs can raise local or, or national issues and receive a response from a government minister. Um, so the way that works is that MPs apply for a debate, and these are allotted uh, on a ballot, which is arranged by the Speaker's office, or they can be determined by the Backbench Business Committee. Um, the Scottish Parliament, um, and again, there we find provision for personal statements. Now, the research didn't find any evidence of these personal statements actually being used, but. It seems reasonable to assume that they are, as in the Commons, um, related to matters of conduct and would not include wider issues or constituency matters. Turning next to the Welsh Parliament, um, standing orders of the Welsh Parliament provide for statements um, which can include statements by members where the subject matter of the statement relates to a function of the Senate for which they are responsible with the agreement of the presiding officer. Um, so what does that mean? Well, accompanying guidance elaborates on it somewhat. Uh, so that would really include, for example, statements by committee chairs, um, introductory, sta introductory statements on a, a piece of legislation um, proposed by a member uh, in charge of that legislation. Um, now, that guidance also goes on to say that members are permitted to ask questions uh, on the business statement and announcement and that this is an opportunity for members to request that the government makes a statement or holds a debate in the chamber on a matter of concern to the member. But again, this doesn't really meet the criteria of an unscheduled statement. Now, as in the Commons in the Scottish Parliament, there is provision for personal statements in the Welsh Parliament. Um, these are referred to as statements of opinion. And what these are, they're statements not exceeding 100 words, which can be tabled by any non-government member and they can be supported, opposed, or otherwise commented on in writing by any other member. Um, now, the guidance on the conduct of business states that these statements of opinion are a mechanism for members to draw attention to issues of concern or highlight achievements by putting their views on a subject on record and canvassing support from other members. Um, so these statements do, or they, they can, in theory, cover a fairly broad range of issues, and there is an example included in the paper. Um, the main drawback, you could say, is that they're published on the website and they're not actually debated in plenary, which you could argue dilutes their impact somewhat in comparison to actually an issue being raised in the chamber. Um, and again, with the procedures around them, you could ask whether they are that sort of quick intervention, intervention on a topical issue. They are perhaps not. Uh, turning next to Doyle Aaron. Um, the standing orders of, of the Doyle do allow for topical issues to be raised at relatively short notice, uh, and the process to be followed is set out in Standing Order 37 of the Doyle. The key points are that notice of topical issues should reach the clerk no later than 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday to be considered for selection on that day, with a maximum of four topics for consideration on each of the three days, uh, plus there is a topic in reserve in the event that one is, is deferred. Um, the Can Corlea has ultimate discretion in choosing topics, but is guided by certain principles uh, which are set out in, in the briefing paper. Um, both the member and minister each have six minutes in total to speak, and the total time for topical issues uh, cannot exceed 48 minutes on any day. Um, the details of Standing Order 37 and the exact process to be followed is contained in Appendix 1 uh, of the paper. Um, so I think that's an example that it probably goes further than the legislatures in the UK, um, but it, it probably still couldn't be described as sort of free from bureaucracy from the point of view of the member. Um, if we turn to some inter a couple of international comparisons, um, they, they probably bring us more relevant examples. The Australian House of Representatives allows for brief 90-second statements by members on any topic of concern, and the period for statements may last up to 30 minutes. And this takes place on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. 
Um, the call is alternated between government and non-government members, and independent members have been given the call uh, with the frequency appropriate to their representation in the House. Um, still within the, the Australian Parliament, the Federation Chamber uh, within the Parliament, uh, it's similar to Westminster Hall, uh, and that sort of non-controversial issues can be raised. Uh, and their standing orders provide for three-minute constituency statements. Um, the content of these statements is not defined in standing orders, uh, and matters of more general interest have been raised without objection. Uh, and these statements are the first item of business on any day that the Federation Chamber meets. And similar, similarly, the Parliament of New South Wales allows members to make short statements about matters in their constituency, as long as the matter does affect their constituency or was brought to them by a constituent. Uh, members can have up to five minutes to speak, with up to 16 members speaking. Um, ministers' replies are limited to two, two minutes each, and up to 75 private member statements may um, take place in any sitting week. In the Canadian House of Commons, uh, a member can be called on to make a statement for not more than one minute on virtually any matter of international, national, provincial or local concern. Um, now, the one-minute time limit is rigorously enforced by the Speaker, who has on occasion cut members off in, in mid-sentence. Um, the time for statements lasts for 15 minutes. Um, time is, is made available for member statements on all five sitting days uh, of the week. Uh, members will have noted the table in relation to the regional Canadian legislatures. Um, they all provide for member statements in some form, usually for around one to two minutes, although uh, the legislature in British Columbia allows for longer statements at seven minutes, uh, with a total of eight minutes for other contributions, including a right of reply for the member making the statement. Um, so that's just a brief overview of the, the paper members. And I suppose to conclude, um, I would say that the research found that obviously the more relevant examples are from the Australian and Canadian parliaments than compared to the UK uh, and Ireland. Um, certainly if we go by which approach entails least bureaucracy for the member and probably for the, the business office as well. Um, Doyle Aaron is perhaps um, the most relevant example in terms of the UK or Irish legislatures uh, in terms of its approach to topical issues. Um, but they are still governed by a framework which is set out in, in standing orders. Um, so that's uh, um, the briefing members, and I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you for the, the brief, I appreciate that. I think it, it probably makes sense that we have to go outside these islands because what happens here already is, is very much based on what's happening in other parts of these islands. That's, that's kind of how it, how it has worked, so it probably is the case that we need to look further afield, and I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, do any members have any questions that they want to ask Ray in relation to the brief? Yeah, Jerry has his Jerry? Uh, indicated, yeah. Okay, Jerry, Carol? Uh, can you hear me okay, Jerry? Yes, we can hear you, Jerry. Yeah, thanks, sorry, I haven't used this <laughs> story before. Um, th thanks for the presentation, Ray. Um, to me, it seems like um, the Doyle sort of operation seems to be the more um, sort of, I suppose, democratic and allow for uh, longer and more um, uh, sort of regular discussions. Um, so, so that would be on first kind of glance my initial preference. I know um, we, alongside others, will be submitting in a, a response uh, chair. Um, I, just to kind of tease that out, would that work sort of similar to a matter of the day instalment, but it would be more um, more regular and more um, applicable to matters that aren't uh, urgent, or what's the kind of difference between uh, practically it operates um, compared to a matter of the day? Um, and then just a just comment on the, the Welsh Parliament um, arrangement. I don't think to be an expert in it. But going by the, the paper and raise uh, presentation, I think the fact that it's um, allowing for 100 words seems to be quite um, quite limited. So, yeah, just a question and an observation. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Chair, I appreciate that. Ray, can you... Yeah, well, I think in terms clarify? of the, the Welsh Parliament, it's 100 words, but it's only a, it's a written statement, really. It's mm. published on the website, and I think that's what I've said, and maybe, maybe it doesn't quite have the same um, impact. Um, in terms of Doyle Iron in comparison with matters uh, of the day, um, I think the remit in Doyle Iron is quite broad. Um, 
and it, it is set out there. Um, I mean, the Cancolia has wide discretion in what he or she might allow, um, but it is also reliant on availability of the ministers as well. Um, so it, in that way, it, it's sort of somewhat more tightly regulated. Um, I think if you look there um, on page five of the briefing, um, yes, the fourth bullet point down, the topics must relate to public affairs connected with the Department of State or to matters of administration for which a member of the government or minister of state is officially responsible. Um, <coughs> so it, it's broad enough, but it's, it's not, say, in comparison to the Australian or Canadian parliaments where really almost any issue can be raised. It it's, goes further than the Welsh, uh, Scottish and UK parliaments, but it's still tightly defined within standing orders and the, the parameters that govern those. And I think, suppose, Jerry, in relation to that, the, the Speaker's concern was around that very issue that we have matter of the day, we have urgent orals, but there's a very tight criteria to them. So this is really, I suppose, to, to try and, and I'm not prescriptive, I haven't taken a position on, on what the best option is, to be, to be honest with you, but I think the Speaker's thinking was that we're very... What's there at the minute doesn't really allow that freedom. It, it's all criteria laid. It's all very tight in terms of that. And, and, and they wanted to look at is there a way of freeing up the time in the chamber and giving members, I suppose, a wee bit more leeway in terms of what they can bring up as you know as a statement or, or, or whatever it will be called whenever we we, we define what we're going to do or how we move forward. But I, I definitely think that this research has has given food for thought and I spoke to the clerk earlier on just in relation to ensuring that all parties and members have access to the research before they respond to us because I think that it is valuable and does give food for thought and I suppose gets the the wheels turning in people's minds about how they should be you know what they should be thinking about or what they should be considering in their response to us as a as a committee. Gary I think you wanted to come in next Yes, thanks, Chairperson, um, and uh, thanks for that useful briefing. Actually, it was um, it was very good. Gary, I can you maybe? Me... Okay. I, I was going to ask you just to speak up a wee bit to just. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Apologies about that. I don't know what the volume issue is. Um, I was just about to say, look, thanks for the presentation. Um, for me, what stood out, I suppose, was the New South Wales. Um, system and also the Australian House of Representatives system, uh, to me, and, and just at a glance, they looked to be somewhat closer to the model that I would foresee, um, based on the fact that, you know, there would be a bit more flexibility. My concern with uh, Dahl Aaron is around the fact that um, you have to give notice of a topical uh, issue, and then that's up for selection. And I suppose that then it's in terms of that criteria as to whether it would be selected. And my worry would be that it would be too rigid, a bit like the way the urgent orals uh, currently operate at this minute in time. Um, but I suppose that it's just a point of view, as I say, but hopefully we can discuss this again uh, closer near the time as we come to the end of the process. Thank you, Gary. Um, I think you're right. This is our opportunity, I suppose, just to raise our, our, our thinking. but. There will be a, a lot more work will have to be done or, around it, I've, I've no doubt. Do any other members want to come in with either comments or questions? I think it has given us much food for thought on this uh, yeah. particular um, research that we have. We've got a very, very good piece of research, and mm -hmm. it does open up the whole, I suppose, the whole thought process of, of the uh, Assembly member to look at it and see what is the best thing, what is the best way forward. And I do think if we're moving forward, we need to be we need to be pushing back those constraints a wee bit that, that we are governed by at the moment. We need to be widening that out a bit, and to do that, then we need to be looking outside and further afield. And and some of the research we've got here that I think really opens this up for us and gives us the opportunity to do something that will enable the assembly member then to bring something that is relevant to his constituency or whatever, and get it brought onto the floor of the House in a member statement. 
I think the, the important element of this for me would be if we're going to make a change, if we're going to do this work, it needs to actually really be something different. If we're tied within the same constraints or, or something similar to what we already have around urgent oils and matters of the day, what's the value of putting Ray through all this work and, and research and the committee considering it and, and doing all of this work and having clerks and, and staff here doing quite a substantial piece of work and every MLA, hopefully, most of them at least, or at least every party and every independent responding to this, to actually not make any real difference. I think if we're going to do this, we want to make an actual real difference, something that people can see that there's something different within the chamber, so that the public can see from the outside in that there's something different, and so that we as elected representatives feel that we have something different, that we have a, a really good opportunity to, to make points. Rosemary's Rosemary, case. I think you had indicated you wanted to come in there. Why have we lost everybody? We've just gone into well, the audience. Further research that has come about. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes, Rosemary, we can. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the research. That's been very, very valuable. Uh, my concern would be, yeah, so I think this is a very good idea. And like Tom, I would agree it has to be broadened a wee bit. For people coming with issues on day, for example, who makes the decision on how many of these, how many of these topical issues are to be heard, or all four be heard? So, Rosemary, you were breaking up a wee bit, but I think what you asked is who makes the decision on how many of the topical issues will be allowed on any given yeah. day? Okay. Uh-huh, yeah. I'm going to let Ray come in on that, but I think that it's probably that's something that the committee will have to decide as part of the work, but I'll let, I'll yeah. let you respond to that. Am I right in saying that, Ray? Yeah, I mean, it would be a matter for the business office and yeah. the speaker, I would assume, really. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. that would be something that we probably have well, to look again, at. Us. Yeah, so the problem there again is there are constraints on it, and which is what we were trying to push back against as as some of the members had said earlier yeah well i suppose i think in fairness to the speaker the speaker is not wanting to put constraints on it they're wanting to leave it as open as they possibly can but obviously at the mm -hmm. end of the day there has to be some way of deciding what comes into the chamber other ways it could be very unruly <laughs> i'm not sure how that would be managed mm -hmm. but yeah. but i do think that everybody's yeah. open i think everybody's probably open to it being as as flexible a process as possible, or at least that's the that's the impression that I got from most members at, at previous meetings. Um, I don't know if Ray wants to come in any further on that. Ray, just in terms of, and I think some of the research and the answer to this might be very similar to the answer we've just given, but how you decide what members, you know, so is it done? Yeah. Is it done in terms of something like De Haunt, or is it on your representation? How, how would that be decided? Or again, is that something that we'd have to? Okay. Well, in terms of the the assembly, it's a matter for procedures. Mm -hmm. It's probably not really for me to comment yeah. on. But if you look at the legislatures, it's mainly done. Uh, I would say on um, party strength. Yeah. Um, basically, so in one example there. Um, don't know whether it was New South Wales, so it was alternated. You could alternate it on government, non-government members, but suppose any system would take into account the particular arrangements that exist in, in, yeah. within the Assembly. But Although you would hope that maybe government, non-government would ensure that, okay, no, listen, I, th I think that's been very, very useful research. Unless anybody else wants to come in, I'm going to let Ray um, finish up and, and leave us unless anybody else has any other comments and no one else is indicating so just first of all to say thank you very much for doing the research and I do think that it has um, great value outside of this committee as well that's why I, I thought that it should be shared with other members and I certainly hope they do read it because it definitely gives good food for thought in terms of responding to us as a committee so I would ask all members to encourage our parties to to read this piece of research, it's it's very useful, and we might as well get the value out of the work that Ray has done. So thank you, Ray, for for coming to the committee. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Members, are you content that we wait on the deadline for responses from parties and independent members to schedule a session during 
the following meeting, which would be the 4th of November. That will be the first meeting after the close um, of date for responses. Are we happy to do that? Okay. I think want yes. to take non dissent as a yes? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're going to move on then to agenda item five, which is the review of Stanton Order 45A. A member will recall that at our last meeting of the 17th of September, the committee considered amending Standing Order 45A and received a briefing from Legal Services on the issue. As a reminder, at the NDNA Annex C, paragraph 3.6, contemplates an amendment to the Opposition Act to provide that a party can enter the official opposition under the Act up to two years following the formation of the Executive. Following discussions at the meeting on the 17th of September, some members created the rationale, rationale rather, behind the two-year period, and we agreed to defer the consideration until today and to write to the Executive Office to ask for the rationale for the two-year period following the formation of the Executive when a party can enter the official opposition. We also wrote to the Secretary of State to ask the same question, and in members' tabled items, a response from the Minister of State. This was only received today, so I would appreciate that not all members have maybe had an opportunity to read it. So I'm going to outline really what was in the response, and I think it would be fair to say we didn't necessarily expect to get a response, so it's good to get it. Um, so Robin Walker MP has explained that this issue was dealt with by a working group which comprised of representatives from all five parties. The agreed period in which parties can form the opposition was a product of a cross-party process. His understanding is that the parties recognised that it was right to provide for a longer period to enter opposition following an election because the current time frame is very restrictive. The extended period also prevents parties entering the opposition for purely electoral purposes, purposes as an assembly election approaches. And we have not yet received a response from the Executive Office. To be fair, I think that's probably because the NDNA is actually an agreement of the two governments. However, it is the basis under which we all came in back into the restored institutions, and therefore I believe that whilst we may not all mm -hmm. think that everything in it is right, we have come back into the institution based on, on the NDNA agreement. So therefore, this is part of it, and I think we need to try and move forward with it. So on page 29 of your packs, there's a covering memo from the clerk. At page 31 is the legal advice, which the committee received in a briefing last week. And at page 40 is the draft motion to amend Stanton Order 45A. I'm going to open it up if, if members have any comments or views, but I would be suggesting that we agree the amendment to Stanton Order 45A today, given that we have now, it originally came to the committee in March. We have discussed it on a number of occasions and we agreed at the last meeting that it would be deferred for two weeks in the hope that we would get a response. And as I say, we weren't necessarily expecting that response. We have had one, which I think explains fully how this was determined and therefore I think we do need to reach an agreement today and move forward with this issue, but I, um, I would like to hear any members' views. Jerry. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Chair. Chair, notwithstanding uh, your and the, the clerk's efforts at getting the response, I appreciate that, but I, I'm not really convinced, to be frank, uh, of the political rationale um, presented by uh, Minister Walker. Um, I kind of alluded to it last week, but I, I think on, on sort of further reflection and discussion with colleagues, um, I'm not really convinced uh, of the necessity for a cut-off point of two years. Um, I think um, it seems to be pretty arbitrary, uh, and the only real rationale for from the minister, um, and as you said, obviously they were sort of um, integral to develop it. The NDNA uh, is that it shouldn't be used for electoral purposes. To me, that sounds pretty vague, and uh, it's obviously uh, a minister in Westminster effectively setting the parameters of what parties here um, can do in terms of you know joining opposition and leaving the executive or not. So um, I understand there may be an, a 
significant minority on this question, but um, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable supporting um, the limiting of, of the the, um, the period where, where parties can leave the executive and join the opposition. I don't see the rationale for it, and, and potentially uh, it would allow um, the likes of a an RHI or another scandal to happen and parties being unable to, to take action if they deem that um, necessary. So I, I would have uh, concerns about it and wouldn't be comfortable supporting um, that position. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Jerry. I suppose just in response, my understanding of it is that whilst a party cannot go into opposition, it doesn't prevent them from leaving the executive. And am I right in That's saying right. that? So just to make that clear, because I know I understand what your concerns Whilst they can't go into official opposition after the two-year period, they, they can't. Their minister can resign from the executive. That that nobody can stop a minister from resigning from the executive. So, just to, just to clarify that, I'm, I'm not sure if that was some your understanding of it or not. Can I just clarify on that, sir? Yeah. What, what would that prevent the in in the likely case of that happening? What would that prevent said party from doing? So they don't have opposition speaking time, presumably, and and then anything else if. If you or, or, or Nick would know that answer, that would be helpful. Thanks. Okay. Gary, so, Gary Middleton. Yeah. Chair, um, well, I, I just propose that we move on. I, I do take Jerry's point, but I think that look, this has been uh, in the New Decade New Approach document. Uh, I think that um, while some of the concerns, you know, I believe to, to be genuine, so it's not the question any of that, I think that we just have to now. Uh, draw a line on this. Let's hope that uh, nobody wants to go into uh, the, the, the opposition in terms of uh, after two years. I can understand why there should be a limit on the basis that what they wouldn't want is, you know, solely for electoral purposes, you know, six months before an election, somebody going to opposition. Um, you know, that, that, that wouldn't be a sensible place to be. I think that, look, the two years, I think we just, you know, move on now. Okay. No. Okay, Sinead. nobody else has, Sinead is sorry, Sinead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. It is a bit broken here, but I suppose in terms of, you know, taking off my party political hat and looking at purely from the, um, the prism of the role that we have to carry out in the procedures committee, it was an agreement. You know, I could talk to the cows come home about whether I think it was the right one or the wrong one. But I, I want to reiterate the points I made earlier that if the agreement was made and we are trying as a collective to put pressure on those two governments to honour the parts that are in their gift, I think it's on us to honour the pieces that we that we have the gift of getting across the line. I, I agree with you, Sinead, and I actually think that we're in a position where we can set example because the, the governments have clearly not honoured some of their commitments. So I think that that we should not set ourselves in the same light. So I agree with you on that basis, and I do take on board um, Jerry's concerns. I suppose the, the cynic would say that there definitely is the potential for, for people to want to go into opposition for elect, electoral gain. But I, but I also see your point in terms of that there could be genuine reasons why somebody would, why a party would want to go into opposition and, and are unable to then after the two-year period. So it, it, it is a difficult balance to strike. But given the position that we're in and that this is part of NDNA, I do think we need to move forward for it, forward with it. So I am proposing that we do move forward with it. And I'm asking for agreement um, from the members that we progress with the amendment. So are members content to amend Standing Order 45A? Agreed. And to our register, no, Chair. Okay. Can we record that? We can, yeah. yeah. That'll go into the minutes. That, that's recorded, okay. Jerry. That that you didn't agree. So I'm taking all other members do agree, as they haven't indicated that they don't. Okay. That's great. Thank you. And John's vote is obviously delegated to me, so yes. he has also agreed. Um, so we just need to make sure we're content with the motion on page 40. Yeah. Um, and then. So, that. just to check, then members are content with the motion draft motion at page 40 of your papers. Yeah. Content? Yes. Agreed. Jerry, do you also want to, to have it recorded that you're not? Yeah. That's fine. Okay. No okay, we're going to move forward then with agenda item six, which is the budget setting methodology.
So, members, at the last meeting, um, the committee considered correspondence from the speaker, which asked the committee to consider placing the budget setting methodology on its forward work programme. During our strategic planning session, the committee agreed to this, and I have written to the speaker to inform him of the committee's decision. At page 42 of your pack, there is a covering memo from the clerk. At page 44 is the letter dated the 24th of July 2020 from the speaker. I just want to ask members to note those items. And as it is the role of the Audit Committee to scrutinise the Commission's budget and potentially ut utilise the methodology, I am aware that the Audit Committee has agreed to seek advice on the best approach to codify its role. Therefore, given the cross-cutting element of this issue, I would like to propose that the Committee agrees to defer its consideration at this stage and that I write to the Chairperson of the Audit Committee confirming our decision to include this issue on our forward work pro programme. Forward the Speaker's letter to the Audit Committee for information and seek an update from the Audit Committee once it has concluded its deliberations. Are members content that we move forward in that manner? And has no. anybody any, any comments or questions? Okay, so members are content. Great, thank you. We will move on then to agenda item 7, which is the proxy voting. Again, at our, member on the, at our meeting rather, at the, on the 17th of September, we agreed that we would continue to consider the instances in which proxy voting could be retained on a more permanent basis and how this might be reflected in standing orders. At page 49 of your pack is a covering memo from the clerk, which provides some background and proposed next steps for the committee to consider. Can members note? The memo. We previously agreed. Sorry, we had previously written to all parties, independent members, and other local legislatures to seek their views. Only a few responses were received. The responses the committee did receive are on pages 54 to 59 of your packs. I would propose that the commission that we commission research on proxy voting. Write again to stakeholders that have not yet responded and schedule a briefing from a business clerk to provide to brief the committee on the use of proxy voting as well as a procedural view of the current temporary provisions. Are members content that we move forward in that manner? Jerry? Thanks, Chair. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if it was in the clerk's memo, but can we just add in that um, we take on board the, the views um, expressed by Claire Shockton about independence and, and having a, a system in place that um, would suit her and, and them in, in future um, scenarios. Obviously, standing orders were, were maybe not created with independent or smaller parties particularly in mind. Uh, there may or may not be an increase in them in, in future elections. Uh, so I think if we can have a, a proxy system that is amenable to independence, um, would be useful if, if that can be added into any any research or any um, presentations. Thanks. It is reflected in the, in the memo, Jerry. But yes, I, I think it's it's fair of you to put those on record. Anyhow, Gary, were you looking in, or was that from a previous topic? No. Okay, fair enough. So members are content that we move on. In that vein, I do think it is an important issue in terms of how we move forward around the the proxy voting and. I think that it is important that we write out to the stakeholders again because we need to get as many views on this as possible. And even given some of the, the issues that have arisen, although there don't seem to be major issues, but even some of the positives that have arisen over the temporary measures, it should give people some food for thought in terms of what their, their responses are. Okay, so members are content? Yep, we'll take that as a yes. Good. So we will move on then to agenda item 8, which is the correspondence. And pages 100 to 102 of your pack are responses from the Church Liaison Group and the Executive Committee and Finance Committee confirming that they are content with the proposals of the temporary provisions in Stanton Order 110 to 116. Obviously, that was already agreed in the Chamber yesterday, so we are a wee bit behind on that one. But um, there are also contact details of the Human Rights Commission while staff are working from home during the COVID-19 pandemic at page 103. Are members content to note these items? Okay. And agenda item 9 then is our forward work programme. 
So just to confirm that at our strategic planning session at the last meeting, the committee agreed to keep the agreed priorities of LCM's member statements and e-petitions on its work programme. The committee also agreed a number of additional topics to its work programme in relation to NDNA, proxy voting and budget scrutiny. These items of business will be factored into our meetings where necessary. At page 105 of your pack, a paper from, Reese, from Raise on LCMs. Are members content to note the paper for now and schedule a briefing from Raise at the next meeting on LCMs? Okay. Thank you. Members are content. Tom, I'm sorry because I keep forgetting to look to you. I'm, look, I'm so so You're busy right looking to Starly, I'm well but I'm sure I'm sure you wouldn't let me go ahead without sure indicating. <laughs> <laughs> um, agenda item two, ten then is the chairperson's business, of which I have none. And agenda item eleven is any other business. Members, as the committee has agreed a number of amendments to Stanton orders, the committee should consider whether it would like to arrange a hard copy print of the amendments for members' copies. Already in this um, mandate, Stanton orders have been amended to reflect the change in a number of members on a committee from 11 to 9. The changes to accommodate temporary provisions, and it has considered further changes today regarding official opposition. Any amendments have been reflected in the electronic version of Stanton Orders on the website, but not in the hard copy. The last refresh of a hard copy of Stanton Orders was in late 2016. So I'd just like the views of the members on whether we, you think that we should go ahead and do the hard copy of the amendments. I mean, as it states, sir, that there, it is in the electronic copy. And just to, to clarify for members, I suppose before we make any comments, it. We won't get a full new hard copy. It will only be on those those standing orders which are amended. So are members content that we do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Members are content. Print. That we go ahead and print a hard copy of the, of the changes to Stanton. Thank you. Orders. Do any members have any other business that they want to raise? No. As no member has indicated, we will move on to agenda item 12, which is the date and time of our next meeting, which is Wednesday, the 14th of October at 2 p.m. in room 29. Room 29 at 2 p.m. will be our regular fortnightly slot from here on in. Okay, members are content. The meeting is closed, adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme 7.1.